Welcome to Season 4 of The Great Humbling. My name's Ed Gillespie, and I'm a futurist, a poet, and a recovering sustainability consultant. In the spring of 2020, during the first lockdown, I began recording a series of conversations with Dougal Hine, co-founder of a school called Home. We started with a question. What if it makes sense to think of ourselves as living in a time of humbling, being laid low, brought down to earth. Pulling on that thread has taken us further and become more central to our work than either of us expected. So we're back now with an open-ended series as part of the wider patchwork of homewardbound.org. Thank you for listening. Ed, this is the first episode that I have arrived at with a glass of bubbly in my hand. Anna is, uh, it's, it's the last days of January. It's the last days of her job at Vesteros Municipality, where she has been working for a very long time. Uh, and so we have five of her dearest colleagues here upstairs. They've just been having lunch and I've wandered straight down from lunch into the middle of this recording. How's that for a way to start the episode? Well, that's commitment. And also fantastic that you have a glass of cold fizz um, <laughs> mid-afternoon mid on a Wednesday. Thursday, even. <laughs> are you going to set us going then, Ed? Yeah. So here we are then. Um, episode three uh, of this fourth series. And we're taking a step back uh, and a look back uh, and listening to some of the earliest episodes that we did almost two years ago. It did feel a bit like in those early weeks of lockdown, everyone was like, oh, gosh, what should we do? Let's start a podcast. <laughs> it's a bit like this January when it seems like everybody who didn't have a Substack already has started one as far as my inbox can tell. I don't know if you've noticed that. I, ha- I haven't started one yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a matter of time, Ed. We spent a lot of that first series circling around the circumstances, circling around the pandemic and the stories that were coiling around it. And then we've, you know, we've wandered off and talked about all kinds of other things, but it seemed like maybe it's time to check in again with like how this thing is going two years on. You know, I mean, I, when I delved back into the archive to listen to that, you know, where we were tracing those those five stories that were already lying around when the pandemic arrived. Um, and we used, used that Milton Friedman quote that was doing the rounds about how when a crisis occurs, you know, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And so you've got to make sure the right ideas are there in order that they can be picked up. So, yeah, and as this, this new thing that the WHO had just declared a pandemic sort of interrupted everyone's plans there were these stories that we seemed to see people picking up left right and center and i guess that was where we started in that first episode but i'm i'm curious ed listening back to the early episodes even before we get to the subject matter how was it (laughs) it's it was slightly surreal. I mean, apart from the fact it's always odd listening back to your own voice, as we know from childhood. Um, and obviously, I'd never recorded a podcast before, and everyone was at it, as you just mentioned. And and then I started too, simultaneously. But listening back to the Great Humbling episode one, I really like the spontaneous energy of of what I might describe as well, not our, but certainly my amateurishness. Um, and there was a sort of liberating devil may care attitude that i think is quite difficult to consciously sustain um especially when you start to build a bit of an audience which then have their own expectations and whether you like it or not i think they inevitably influence you in some way not that we're necessarily playing to the crowd and i'm not blaming our audience um for the way that the podcast has evolved but i really appreciated the experimental freshness which in some ways i think along with the times wasn't always exactly sure where it was going but did feel like it knew the way to travel if not always the direction or the destination and i think our gently assured wandering felt quite nice um in retrospect and i don't think we've lost that at least i hope we haven't but um it it certainly felt more present in those very first explorations together yeah and what struck me was how long those early (laughs) conversations were we talked for an hour in that first episode. I'm amazed that 
that held people's attention. I mean, we've gone to this monthly format and we've been joking, but like, the first month we did 35 minutes, the next it was about 33. And it's like, you know, sooner or later we'll get better and better until we don't need to release an episode at all. <laughs> the brevity is next to godliness. This is uh, a minute's silence with Dougald and Ed. Sorry, I, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> but what's different now as well? I mean, okay, we've got—I've got the sort of cars whizzing past outside the the window of the shoe shop. But while I was listening back to those first episodes, I found myself nostalgic for your Brixton Hills sirens. Mm. We don't get many of those in the background nowadays. And uh, no, I—I I don't think I've heard a siren <laughs> since I've been in Norfolk. Uh, <laughs> certainly not from my window. So going back to that first episode, then I had this image of mapping lava trying to make sense of the pandemic was a bit like making a map of a moving landscape that hadn't mm. hardened into place yet. And I guess why it felt right to revisit this now is not, not because the landscape has hardened into place exactly. It's almost more that it feels like the surface is cracking and things are on the move mm. again in the stories of the pandemic. And I've felt that over the last month or two. But before we get stuck into that, I want to bring back another tradition that's slightly fallen by the wayside. Ed, what have you been reading or listening to or whatever that's been that's been getting you thinking over the past few weeks? Yeah, no, I've missed this tradition. Um, well, I've had a rather sort of self-indulgent bibliophile start to the year. Um, I have ploughed through a small pile of books already, uh, which are now tottering next to the bed. So. Isn't that just called being a freelancer in January? <laughs> exactly. It sort of goes with the territory. Is like, oh, well, work hasn't really started, so I'm going to really, really have a good time. Um, but one one that's really stuck out uh, was Richard Power's Bewilderment, um, which following on from you know the massive success of the overstory, which was trees and climate and people and migration, and um, it was really beautiful. But Bewilderment is a much tauter, um, tighter novel. Um, it, 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 I mean, the overstory can be occasionally be a bit baggy in places, um, even though it was beautiful. But this one is about an astrobiologist widower and his young son. Um, and I, it, it really chimed with me just because it's about the challenges of single parenting. Um, it's about bereavement and loss, um, because of obviously the loss of his wife and the mother of his son. Um, and then this sort of slightly odd juxtaposition with the search for extraterrestrial life. And as you're going into the book, it's like, your mind is being stretched because there's this intimacy and immediacy and then there's this sort of intergalactic um possibility uh, and then you throw in this evocative artificial intelligence plot twist that um enables the characters to have a sort of reconnection with the dead through a digital experience of mapping one's own emotions to a stimulation of the deceased brain um and it's it's quite out there but it's extraordinarily evocative um, it's really tender and, and beautiful and quite tragic. Both the sensitive child's perspective on the madness of the adult world, which any of us who are parents will will connect to, I think. There is inevitably the, the threads around climate and species loss and ecology and habitat um, degradation and all that systemic jazz that we talk about. But um, it, it, it's, a, it's a really wonderful meditation on, on relationships, both sort of parental, ecological, digital and of course intergalactic and and there's a kind of repeated trope in the book that again really sticks with me it was like they literally build worlds together you know they will sit down by way of a bedtime story and and take a particular distant exoplanet and imagine the life and culture that might exist on it um so as i say it, it really struck me as a parent um and with my activist hat on and and it leaves you with this sort of rather haunting sort of legacy of innocence different perspectives and the priorities that people have in the in these weird times i'm glad to hear you've been getting on with it so well because I, I have to say i loved the overstory and it maybe it helped that i listened to it as an audiobook and mm. i listened to it twice which for a book of that length wow. is saying something and it felt like I mean, that book and Amitav Ghosh's Gun Island between them are, to me, the novels that I was longing for and not finding mm. when Paul and I wrote The Dark Mountain Manifesto and uh, not claiming it as any kind of Dark Mountain achievement, but just to say we've arrived at a place where 
our best writers are um, writing novels, even within mainstream literary fiction, which both of those you could argue belong within that bring other species in that the books that aren't going to look horrific in hindsight, given how mm. much we already knew about the depth of the mess we were in, which was basically my indictment of everything that was being celebrated in the literary pages of the papers 10 or 12 years ago. It's a, str- it's a stretch of the imagination though, isn't it? I mean, like you say, when, when other species become key equal characters in the book, I mean, I read Elif Shafak's The Island of Missing Trees, um, which is about Cyprus. And, you know, one of the central characters is a fig tree. Right. You know, and it, and it, that magical realism, you saw it initially, you're like, oh, I'm not sure how I'm going to handle this. And by the end of it, you know, you're empathising as much with the tree as you are any of the human characters. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I so I just started Bewilderment and I'm not I'm not totally I captivated by it yet in the way that I was by the overstory. But what did strike me with the opening section of it is this father and son thing, mm. you know, because it starts with them going off on this trip. It's a, very, it's, you know, it's a very clever device. So they start off going off into the middle of nowhere. And therefore, during that opening section, it's not yet clear that we're in a kind of a literary sci-fi future rather than in the present moment. And mm. then as they return to quote unquote civilization, it, the, the details make it obvious where we are. But what that brought up for me is thinking about I, what a trope that is, particularly in American literature, mm. in the American novel. And it brought up for me two books that are very important to me, very different books. Cormac McCarthy's The Road. I knew you, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. And, and then Robert Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And I, The Road is kind of a... a uh, a post-apocalyptic remake of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's really interesting to put those two books together, partly because the father-son dynamic within them is echoing something deeper. Mm. There's a mythic Mm. layer there, Mm. which is the story of Abraham and Isaac Mm. from the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible. So I'm just kind of curious about, uh, I think, uh, you know, a writer as accomplished as, as Powers and as aware as Powers is going to be consciously inserting himself into a tradition by beginning the book in the same way. So I'm kind of curious how that's going to going to play out as the book goes on. But maybe also, you know, in the same way that the, the single parent aspect of it really spoke very personally to you, I think the father and son aspect of all of those books mm. speaks to me. And I mean, if I think about the, the reading I've been doing lately, a whole lot of it is father-son reading. You know, I we got Alfie... The, the the Narnia Chronicles for Christmas and we're currently one and a half books into that. And the other one, his his godfather Christopher sent him for his birthday last year two Tintin books. I'd never read Tintin. I don't know. Did you really? grow up with Tintin? Yeah, you'd never read Tintin. Amazing. No. Uh, How did you manage to avoid Tintin? I guess you were just enmeshed in Alan Garner. Uh, yeah, something like that. I mean, I read lots of Asterix, but uh, somehow Tintin had never come onto my radar. And now I'm... So it's that lovely thing. Sometimes you get to discover something that mm. is just a brilliant piece of art that is totally there for kids and also totally enjoyable as an adult discovering it for the first time. And I... So I'm reading these with him. I, I have to say, I've got quite into my Captain Haddock. <laughs> Billions of blue blistering barnacles in a thundering typhoon. Oh, no. I'm going to have to re-record that because the levels were like way over the top. I'm going to just lean back and record that again. Billions of blue blistering barnacles in a thundering typhoon. <laughs> so, I think Captain Haddock made me want to be a marine biologist. <laughs> Was it accurate as a depiction of the amount of whiskey that you could expect? Uh, no comment. <laughs> so the other thing that I've been reading, I've been revisiting a book called Ideas on the Nature of Science, which is based on an extraordinary Canadian CBC radio series, a 24-part series, 24 one-hour episodes called How to Think About Science. Mm. And it was the radio series was made by 
David Cayley, who's a very interesting guy. He was a friend and collaborator of Illich. He did two books with Illich, and he's published a book about Illich more recently. And it was basically him interviewing this international collection of thinkers, some of whom are scientists and some of whom are you know, philosophers or sociologists or whatever, whose work has brought them to spending time around scientists and thinking about what this thing we call science is. And you know, there's just fascinating voices in there. Mary Midgley, Barbara Duden, David Abram, Brian Wynne. Mm. And I, I think I, I, I came back to it over Christmas because I needed something more expansive than the kinds of conversations about science that we've been having over the last two years during the pandemic. So we might come back to that later in this episode, but I'd really, really recommend um, that book of interviews. So a- anything else you've been reading, Ed, that's mm. really got you going? Um, well, a- an old school friend, actually, who's a senior librarian at the British Library, very kindly sent me a copy of Richard Price's The Owner of the Sea. Um, and I don't want listeners to think I'm just mainly reading Richard's this year. I have read <laughs> a diverse uh, range of authors with different Christian names. Um, but The Owner of the Sea is like a poetic retelling of, of, of three old Inuit stories, Sedna the Sea Goddess, Kiviuk the Hunter, uh, and The Old Woman Who Changed Herself Into a Man. Um, and it's one of those books which is just... You know, it's stunning. Um, and it, it's such an immersion into this strange and wonderful northern world of magic and shape shifting and, you know, elemental connection where, you know, a walrus breath or the beat of a seagull's wing changes the weather and, and all of these intimate creaturely relations and, you know, and gender transmogrification. And it's, it's so vivid and weird. Um, it's fantastic, but it also, it also triggered one of those serendipity moments that I know we're fond of on this podcast because um, my friend Lucy Hinton um, shared a poem she'd written called The Singing Bone um, that stemmed from a dream she'd had about a flute carved from bone. And and when she posted it, she sort of commented herself that she had no idea where this image came from, um, but it had inspired her to, to put pen to paper. Literally the previous night, I'd been reading Kiviuk the Hunter um, and a singing bone had turned up, you know, in in that poem. Um, and I was just going to read a short bit, but it just goes, you know, he was exhausted, but he dragged his kayak away from the water and he heard a voice crying out, please clean my eye. And Kiviuk went to find out a seal bone was there on the beach, all mucky. Please, please clean my eye, it whimpered. And Kiviuk cleaned away the dirt and there was a small hole near one end. Thank you, said the bone. And it's just this wonderful connection of this singing bone. Like someone writes a poem, they're not quite sure where the inspirations come from. And I'm like, well, this is actually, you know, a deep Inuit mythical um, element of of music coming from the bones of the dead. So that's the owner of the sea. Yeah. And, you know, the mention of Inuit poetry brings me back to that quote that I ended series one with from the contemporary Inuit poet, Tacrylic Partridge, where she's asking us, what if the pandemic is just the warning shots of the real storm ahead? Mm. So, yeah, I'm wondering, how is the storm? How is the landscape of lava looking now? Mm. What's your sense of how things are at the start of 2022? Um, Well, I, I mean, there's so many elements to this, but I think... You know, it does feel like we're just on this progressive journey of uh, apocalypse. Um, and I'm, I used this metaphor right at the beginning, I think, in terms of the revelatory aspects. And I think it's just, it feels like here we are now, we're just doing layer upon layer of excavation. Um, and unfortunately, I think as we've dug deeper through these sort of layers of revelation and excavation, it has actually just exposed more divisions. And there's very little kind of middle ground, you know, whether that, and that doesn't matter which aspects you're talking about you know whether it's the vaccinated or the unvaccinated it's the all back to the office you know um where we've got this sort of rallying cry of everyone get back to your desk um versus you know no one back to the office um i did some work with nationwide earlier earlier this year and nationwide you know the world's biggest building society has essentially said no one has to come back to work 
We don't need buildings anymore. Well, and it's it's fascinating. And then... Bit of an existential crisis for a building society, I would think. Just in terms of the sort of, you know, the lava is also... I've had some really interesting conversations around, you know, the frame of whether it's... Is it five minutes to midnight on climate? You know, post COP26, you still have this kind of, oh, we still have time, you know, we can do this. You know, it's always like we're buying time. Um as opposed to others who are basically saying, look, it's already five past 12, guys. What do you do, you know, when it, if you actually acknowledge it's five past midnight? And then, of course, you've got all of the the inequality stuff, the haves and the have-nots and the very polarised experiences of where we, where we, people have um, been and the way that that then plays back into those culture wars stuff. There's a lot of this sort of you know, libertarianism versus control and people finding themselves on odd sides of the argument, you know? <laughs> yeah, I've de- I've definitely heard that Yeah, in recent weeks. I've heard people going, I don't know who I am anymore yeah. because <laughs> I find myself agreeing with people who are not the kind of people I've ever seen myself as being. Yeah. And I don't think, uh, like... It's that there's not like a single version of that. I feel like that's a thing that people are experiencing in different dimensions, in different, in different directions. And I mean, my sense in the last few weeks, the reason I wanted to come back to this theme is that, yes, things have been kind of starkly polarized. And in a way, those, those kind of polarized positions felt quite stable for a lot of last year Mm. um Mm. and then now it really feels like everything is in in flux again and like the story is splintering it's moving in different directions at once and it's so different in different countries now it's no longer just everyone in lockstep and then sweden over here being weird and different (laughs) i've been talking to friends around the world in the last few weeks and you know their experiences are so different depending on the countries they're in and the ways their politicians are talking about things. And I, you know, I know people in France and in Italy who, for one reason or another, have not yet taken the vaccine and who are literally shut out of you know, being able to participate in their societies. You've got Macron saying you know, the, um, the irresponsible ones um, don't deserve to be citizens which is a scary thing mm. for mm. a political leader to be saying. Like, yeah. if you, even a year ago, if you or I had suggested that that was where things are headed, people would have called us mad conspiracy theorists. And whole parts of Europe, mm. that's reality now. Meanwhile, other realities are playing mm. out in other terrains. So, you know, I was talking to a friend from New Zealand who's like, yeah, I was hoping to finally get back to my country after two years of not being able to go there. But now, because of Omicron, it's like total shutdown again. And he said, if I were the politicians, I'd be doing and saying the things they're doing and saying. But I think they have to give up on this idea that you can just keep this pandemic out. But it's really hard for the politicians to make Mm. that decision because that decision is going to be represented back to them as thousands of people are going to die because you've just changed the policy. Mm. And I mean, it's sympathy for the politicians is not a an easy drum to beat in lots of parts of the world right now but i i kind of felt what he was feeling for them at that point but i'm curious what's the what's the atmosphere like in the in the uk at, at this point well i don't sure sympathy for the politicians would make a very good rolling stones song either oh i mean oh what's it like what's the atmosphere like in the uk at this stage <laughs> um I was sort of led by... This is the bit in the episode where I gave Ed permission to read. Yeah, exactly. I mean, God. I mean, it's, it's... But just on that first point, though, it's like, what does it feel like? I mean, it feels like everyone's had it. Um, you know, I, mean, I was just recording The Future Nords this morning, and, you know, John Richardson's got it a second time. Um, you know, he's sort of down with COVID, but he's almost entirely asymptomatic, but he's still having to isolate, you know. And, uh, Are people less scared of it now because of that? Yeah, I think so. I think I think inevitably that's like, you know, people have been through it. You know, they haven't been hospitalised. They've, you know, they've felt a bit rough for a day or two. I mean, like, again, we, you know, it's a cliche, but it's like, oh, well, I've, you know, I've had the flu. Um, 
uh, you know, all John was doing was grumbling about the to-do list that, you know, his wife and he had agreed that he'd have to go through. And he goes, he goes, I'm supposed to be ill. You know, the whole point of self-isolating was that, you know, you could sit and watch Netflix in your pants um, <laughs> rather than actually having to do the chores. Um, but I think, you know, there's an element of, I guess, weariness to it. I think some of that sort of deep-rooted fear and precaution has waned there's a frustration and and i think an impatience uh, at the other end of the extreme and there's a lot of anger um and that anger as you say like the splintering of the story in many directions that anger is is splintered in many different directions you know um there's the obvious political stuff you know probably best encapsulated by cassette boys rage against the machine pastiche with you know boris saying fuck you i won't do what i tell you there's absolute fury that when people couldn't go to the funerals couldn't see their loved ones dying in hospital you know there's drinks parties going on at the seat of government where the rules are being made and i think you know it's very hard to explain how furious people are at that because it's it's almost beyond words. You know, I actually ran a senior senior level leaders workshop the other day and I had a very senior civil servant in tears and she only broke down as she started to articulate, you know, how she was. And she just said, you know, I'm sick of working for these hideous people, you know, and I've never seen that before. So, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's such, there's such kind of vitriol there. Um, and, and, you know, and that, and that, applies in all sorts of other um, contexts, circumstances as well. I think people just want to move on. And, uh, you know, it's it's weird. Again, like you say, you find yourself, in hindsight, looking back to things that were said two years ago. It's like the cure or the pain mustn't be worse than the cure. And it's like, <laughs> I know, you, know, you find yourself... Do going, you remember who said that? Trump! I know. Yeah. I know, I know. And I've, that's what I mean. You find yourself in a position going, now... I mean, I would never have said that two years ago, but now I find myself, you know, I, perhaps I wouldn't articulate that publicly except on a podcast, but there's a small voice in my head which starts to, you know, have that conversation with me. So I'm curious then, what did, like, you've listened back, I've listened back to the first episode and I listened to the one where we talked about the cultivation of conspiracy as well. What did we get wrong, Ed? <laughs> what seems strange listening back now nearly two years on yeah well, you know me my futurist hat on i don't make predictions but um i think we were very careful then <clears throat> not to make predictions but um i don't know i think i i think what feels strange in particular is like you know the irascibility of this conflict um i think was live then and even more so now around the potential transformative aspects of this experience and i remember you quoting paul kingsnorth as saying you know this civilization will learn nothing um from this experience and you know then the conventional retrenchment um you know back to normal back to work back to the desk all of that stuff i, I was struck by our acceptance of the situation and, uh, and it makes me reflect on what is healthy or unhealthy uncertainty because I do think we have to always try and embrace as much uncertainty as possible. Um, but in a way, we were sort of trying to cling to some kind of authority uh, in the fact that we were told this was the right thing to do. This was the safe option. I was struck by just how matter of fact we were about lockdown. Because mm. it was, you know, it must have been end of March 2020 when we recorded that first episode. And we were just talking about this as, yeah, this is obvious. This is common mm. sense. And, you know, actually having thought about this and read about this more, I'm now more aware than I feel like I was then of what a radical new approach to an infectious disease that was, like how unprecedented mm. the way that societies were shut down. Now, maybe we were also at that point still in the sort of it's two weeks to flatten the curve story. And it felt like that was part of what went on was you know, two weeks to flatten the curve, then 12 weeks to beat it back or whatever Boris said. And then it was like, oh, we'll be over. We'll be, it'll all be, it'll all be fine by Christmas. Mm. Um, and then we got, then there was this kind of, we're hanging in there for the vaccines. And that felt like that was the story for a long time. And we were talking about that in last spring's, series 
and and as sort of spring and summer turned to autumn, one of the things I noticed definitely last year was the intensity of the hatred directed at anyone who was expressing any skepticism or who hadn't been vaccinated. You know, speaking as somebody who had you know, who who's vaccinated myself and doesn't have any particular misgivings about that, I found myself really put off mm. the people who on paper on that metric alone would think of themselves as being on my side and I'm on the right side and we're on the same side. And it felt like a lot of that hatred was actually generated by people feeling, I just want this to be over and we've been promised it'll be over once everyone's vaccinated. So anyone who's not got vaccinated yeah. yet, you're being really selfish because you're standing in the way of this being over. Yeah, yeah. Which doesn't have a lot to do with the science of it as far as I can no. see. No, my, my, my brother's unvaccinated. So, you know, trust me, I've had conversations. But they're, I mean, they're not, as you say, they're not, they're not full of hatred and, and venom. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing that strikes me just thinking about the lockdown thing here in Sweden, we were the, the country that had the lightest restrictions, let's say, through pretty much the whole pandemic. And we've done, you know, we did an episode where we talked about the specifics of that. But what I, what I actually was only pointed out to me yesterday, I hadn't spotted this, is that Sweden's also the only country in Europe that didn't have excess mortality over the course of 2021. So uh, at a certain point, you begin to wonder how much excess mortality was, yeah, obviously, this is not a conspiracy theory saying, oh, all of that excess mortality was other things. No, loads of people died of COVID, um, like multiples of what an ordinary bad flu season would be. But I also, I, one of my memories from the early weeks of the pandemic was being on a call with a few people I knew in different parts of the UK, and two of them just spontaneously bringing up stories of people they knew of who had died in the first weeks of lockdown, not of COVID, but of the consequences of lockdown. In one case, it was a woman in her 90s who was used to, she had family living around the corner who would come in three times a day. And that was like how her life worked and why she was able to live at home. And she died within you know weeks of the beginning of lockdown. In another case, it was someone who, you know, I think in in their forties, living in a care home with severe um, learning difficulties, who could not cope with the utter disruption of the routine around their life, and just stopped eating, and again died in March 2020. And that's anecdotal, but um, the cost, the toll, and you know, actually, the toll has not been trivial even in sweden i've seen like how it's affected people's mental health i've heard stories of suicides that you can pretty clearly trace back to the way that everyone's lives have been so disrupted over the last two years but hmm. um then when we get to this thing of you know the vaccine passports and so on there was a big demonstration in stockholm last weekend and it was reported in the news as an anti-vax protest now, I'm sure that plenty of people there were anti-vaxxers, but it was a protest against the vaccine passport. And it has staggered me the inability of my old profession in the news industry to distinguish between those two things or the kind of the conscious misrepresentation the failure to acknowledge. And it's interesting because you've, again, I think feel like this has begun to slip in the last few weeks that I, I noticed one day in December, a Guardian article about a protest in mm. Austria. And it was the first time I'd read an article in the Guardian about protests that didn't paint people as far right extremists, conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers, but actually reflected that there might be a genuine mm. uh, deep cause for concern about the powers that were being deployed in the name of public health when it comes mm. to the restriction of people's ability to participate 
in society if they haven't taken some mandatory medical treatment. Yeah, well, also, I know the restrictions, I mean, I think I shared that link with you, didn't I, about the Van Gogh Museum, where, you know, the cultural, oh, instit- the cultural institutions aren't allowed to open in lockdown, but hairdressers are. So I think the curator of the museum offered haircuts to allow people to come and see the galleries. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's gaming the system in a, in a geni- genius way. That's artists at their best. I always say yeah. you know, the definition of an artist is someone who, if you give them a black and white choice, they will find a third option. <laughs> <laughs> but and one of the most alarming things for me has been not just the vaccine authoritarianism, but actually the, the utter breakdown of comprehension over it, mm. where you have two sides who are not just talking past each other, but barely able to conceive of where each other might be coming from because what seems obvious to one group of people it seems ridiculous to the other. And again, I'm like, I'm factoring out the conspiracy theorists and the people who are just like against the vaccine full stop, just between the people who are deeply concerned about the policies of vaccine authoritarianism and um, people for whom it just mm. seems so axiomatic that in the name of public health, obviously we can do this, that and the other. That alarms me. Yeah. I mean, I, that made me think of, you know, the thing that's just unfolding um, today on Spotify, where, you know, Spotify is removing Neil Young's um you know, oeuvre um, from its site because he doesn't want it to be on the same platform as Joe Rogan's podcast, which he is, has been accused by lots of people of spreading, you know, misinformation. But I mean, it's a good example of that sort of bifurcation, isn't it? It's like, I think Young basically said to Spotify, you know, you can have Neil Young or Joe Rogan, but you can't have both. It's a good example of the dysfunctionality of the mm. way that we are trying to... Mm. I. I don't even want to say public conversation, but like, if the way that we're dealing with big divisive issues is through Neil Young throwing his weight around and having a strop and taking his music off Spotify, that's not a great <laughs> sign of the quality of our ability as societies to really talk together and think about and make sense of what is going on here, is it? That was a rhetorical question. You don't need to answer it. (laughs) (laughs) But again, there is this sense as well that something's definitely shifted in the past month or so. I mean, you probably saw it as well. Clive Dix, the former head of the UK Vaccine Task Force, was being quoted in The Guardian the other day. They had a big article with a headline, End Mass Jabs and Live With COVID, says former Vaccine Task Force head. And it's like even a few weeks earlier, it seemed that the orthodoxy was that everybody was going to need to get a booster every three months forever or be denied the ability to participate in the life of society. And mm. I like that's part of what gives me the sense that things are splintering and moving and reshaping fast again at the moment. I don't think we know, just in the same way as when we recorded that first episode, we were very conscious of going, we don't know where all this is going to land sort of feels like we're in that again Mm. just now. So, Ed, who do you think has had a bad pandemic? (laughs) Uh, I mean, beyond all that Partygate stuff we were joking about earlier, um, I do think there is, uh, you know, a a terrible indictment of a lot of the mismanagement um, politically in the UK. Um, You know, the British Medical Journal has described the UK government's response as socialised murder. Um, But then I think there's also that really murky undercurrent, you know, of these like like personal protective equipment, the PPE procurement scandals in the UK. Um, these bounced back loans and the corruption, um, people creating companies on the hoof in order to, you know, cash in on the public purse. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, that's been really, really dark. Um, and also I think, you know, the sort of hagiography of NHS staff, you know, just being overburdened and overwhelmed and protected and held up. And at the same time, you know, not, properly protected or rewarded um i think that's been extremely difficult so i mean 
you can pick all sorts of um, different examples of of who uh, both individuals and collectively have had a bad pandemic. I'll tell you who I think has had a bad pandemic. Public intellectuals. Does that include us? I I think that's for I think that's for others to judge. But um, I yeah I certainly I don't I don't exclude us from this judgment entirely. Um, so what got me thinking about this was a piece last summer by Justin E. H. Smith, who's an American philosopher who's based in Paris, and um, he wrote about uh, I, th- I think the piece was called "Covid is Boring." And one of the things he was saying in it was he was talking about how little he had said or written about the pandemic during that time. And he said, I'm not a public health expert, nor an investigative reporter. And I just do not have much to say that is not also being said in a million other places. I watch with amazement my friends and peers who have somehow nonetheless easily transformed themselves into what look like full-time volunteer nodes of information on epidemiology, on delta rates in Alabama and the aerial spread of miasmas in ventilated versus unventilated spaces. And he goes on, I have trouble seeing the ease with which so many educated people have taken up this new volunteer role as anything other than the sign of the total absconsion of the intellectual class in the age of the Twitter COVID complex. Smith calls it the the total takeover of the intellectual class by STEM style thinking. So STEM is like science, technology, mm. engineering, and maths. And this is what sent me back to that Cayley book, Ideas on the Nature of Science, because the way I see it, it's become like the default move from so many people has been what I would call thinking on behalf of science instead of thinking about science. So Mm. it's like science has done its work and then the thinkers come in after it and help to say things in different ways that will, I suppose maybe why I react against this is because it's precisely the role that I have spent years arguing artists need to refuse when it comes to climate change. Because, you know, nine out of 10 projects involving art and climate change come to artists and one way or another they're saying, we need you to help us deliver the message. Hmm. And I'm like, no, that's not like art isn't that good at delivering messages. It's not what it's for. And I, I spent two years working with the Swedish National Theatre. And one of the things that came out of that was a list of alternatives of other things that art can do under the shadow of climate change that aren't being a cheap alternative to a, an advertising agency or a sophisticated extension yeah. of the PR department. Yeah, guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. I mean, you know, I, I, fifteen years ago, I literally used to run workshops for artists on, you know, how to deliver the message. <laughs> right, and I feel like what I've seen during this time is that, you know, the idea that science is a thing we need to think about and ask questions about has been kind of thrown out of bounds. That's become what the you know what the conspiracy theorists and weirdos do. Um, and the kind of the orthodoxy has been, you know, what we do is listen to the people in white coats and then amplify their message. We turn ourselves into megaphones. Mm. And I don't like, I'm not speaking against science when I call that into question. I'm saying I don't think science is well served by us reorganizing things in that way. So that's a troubling legacy for me of the last two years. But all right, let's turn the question the other way around. Who... Who's had a good pandemic? Oh, um, well, if you, if you look at Oxfam's wealth aggregation um, analysis, you tend to see exactly how much trickle up has worked for um, the very few. You know, most of the world's billionaires have um, dramatically increased their wealth, um, which has led to a lot of this edge of space dick waving by uh, Jeff Bezos and and, and Branson. Um, but also that fast forward effect, I guess, that we also alluded to in episode one um, where you've seen this sort of acceleration and intensification of bifurcations, which were already happening. So, um, you know, particularly in terms of, of jobs and inequality, um, you know, you've had beaten down um, 
what we used to call low skilled workers and then they were rebranded as key workers but they still haven't you know their their lot has not dramatically improved even though they're the ones who've kept the whole system running well meanwhile the well-off white collar workers who've had the space to retreat back and have ironically saved huge amounts of money because they haven't been out spending it um and then have bought second homes and yeah, with all the knock-on effects of that happens. So all of that, you know, if if that is good, in inverted commas, you know, they, but they've certainly had a good pandemic. I was going to say there's different senses of having a good pandemic. You know, there's those who've benefited from a time when lots of others have suffered. But then maybe we could also look for, like, who are the people, or the groups or the, the agencies within society whose moral standing emerges strengthened? from the past two years and that'd be a very different list yeah i i think that's true and i when i read a piece um it was an interview with rosbel kagumire um who's a pan-african feminist uh, and she wrote really sort of uh, passionately about the role of women in 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 the recovery whatever you want to call it but um you know the fact that women make up the majority of healthcare professionals you know they're usually deeply embedded in all the essential community outreach and support um they're also on the receiving end uh, of much of the domestic violence that uh, has occurred during um lockdowns in particular um and they are left still struggling, you know, and tackling a lot of the sort of hierarchical, patriarchal and colonial structures. Um, and also being again on the kind of the sharp end of the vaccine apartheid, which exists around, around the world. So I think, as you say, the moral standing has emerged, you know, much strengthened because they have been able to hopefully begin to raise that voice uh, of the key role that women and women of colour have played in resilience to to the pandemic. Yeah, when you were talking about that, it made me think of something that Laura Stevens, who's part of our, our long table community around the school called Home, um, said to me the other day when she, she said, yeah, you know, um, feels like it's about recovery and discovery and uncovery and that um that sense of those three activities as part of i mean maybe that's part of what the remapping mm. is about as well and i'm i just really struck in conversations i've had lately with people by the ambiguity mm. of what's happened like how it's been such a different experience depending on your circumstances. And we often talk about that in class terms, in terms of the you know, the difference depending on what kind of job you have. It's also true in terms of family and stage of life. And it's like, I realise that my life hasn't been heavily curtailed. And so I can, you know, because when you've got a six-year-old, it's not like you're out partying or going to the theatre or whatever all the time anyway. And then I talked to friends who were like, yeah, and when I got my second jab and things started to get back to normal in the autumn, like people who'd been living on their own and were just like, yeah, I was like, I had people staying or I was going and staying with friends like every night because I felt like I had so much to catch up on. Mm. And you just realise what a lonely experience the past two years has been for anyone who lives on their own mm. or whatever. Yeah whatever age in life. The same thing goes for you know, the the impact of lockdown as an economic phenomenon, because, you know, on the one hand, that's brought huge hardship. I think for lots of people with small businesses, even where there has been support and help, lots of small businesses have gone to the wall. And on the other hand, if you're like, if that's not your situation, if you were working in a job that didn't bring much joy into your life, that you didn't love mm. much, then you know, it can quite easily um, have been a relief and a release to have that normality disrupted for you. <laughs> yeah. And I think just maybe part of the humility that's called for at this stage is recognising that those things can be true. Mm. And it's not a contest as to who's right about that. It's about where you stand and the shape of your life. I mean, I recently read... Um my friend Julia Hobsbawm's book, a new book called The Nowhere Office, um, talking about some of, you, you, you know, that discontent and dissatisfaction with work, which has felt sort of either 
purposeless or you know even pointless at the kind of um sharper end and you know this idea of the great resignation where we've got the highest sort of number of resignations um that we've had in in decades and and i think that's also been driven by and yeah acknowledging that there's a privilege to some of this but you know the the difference between the working from home and the working from anywhere and like i said with the nationwide example i mentioned earlier and this new sort of hybrid normal um because there was such a sort of turmoil in in the fact that we were able to you know house everyone who's homeless um and now obviously we've put many of those people back on the streets you know which feels incredibly regressive um but the but the working from home issue has huge implications for commercial real estate if if large organizations aren't going to have either the same scale of head office or or even any office you know and many small organizations are already making that shift anyway um and i think this is part of the kind of you know return to normal drumbeat of this desperately shrill cry of everyone get back to your desk please um because if that commercial real estate then falls in value you know that's connected into lots of people's pension funds and all that investment but also the flip side of that it means it labels a reinvention and reimagination of that commercial real estate which solves housing crises you know and also we can reset we could you know at least in principle here recenter humanity um so you recenter humanity in in the way and where people work but also we recenter humanity in the the physical environment of the city um now whether that will happen as we always say in kind of mapping lava but there's certainly those trickles of possibility that are still there that haven't been completely cut off um and and could be nurtured yeah i can hear my sort of inner paul king's north going uh, on the one hand right uh, this civilization doesn't want to recenter humanity and apart apart from (laughs) in the sense that it already does because it's anthropocentric and doesn't give a shit about (laughs) all the rest of the living world that we're part of but i what was coming to mind for me actually was a sort of humbling moment that i had just after we moved here to astavola so it would have been beginning of february last year and I was taking a bunch of the the stuff, the old fittings from the shoe shop to the the tip or the recycling centre and talking to the guy who works there. And firstly, we had like an eight minute conversation and he told me a fair bit of like the story of his life. And I thought, wow, you know, in eight years of living in Vesteros, there probably were fewer than half a dozen people who I had had a conversation where they told me that much about their life in the city where we lived but i was kind of saying to him oh yeah also anna's still working for the time being um with the municipality investors but of course because of the pandemic she can sit at home and work from her computer and and i realized in that of course was a complete like line dividing different kinds of work from each other because Mm -hmm. if you work for the municipality and your job involves going around and doing care work for people in their homes or being the guy at the tip who tells people not to put their things in the wrong container and has nice conversations Mm. with newcomers. Then there's no logic that says you can suddenly sit at your breakfast table and do it. And in fact, the defining quality of the jobs which people can do from home is that they're the sort of jobs where to lots of people, it's a question over like, what do you actually do? And it made me think that, you know, obviously we have David Graeber's famous category of bullshit jobs. And he spoke about it in terms of the jobs that people who do the jobs experience as bullshit. But there's another layer of it, which is like, I don't experience what I do for a living as bullshit, but I do sometimes have difficulty explaining it to my neighbours or my in-laws or whatever. Or the guy at the municipal recycling facility. Or the guy at the tip. Yeah, and... Oh, just a certain sensitivity to the fact that I almost by definition, if you can do your job from home, there's a question mark over whether it's a real job at all from the point of view <laughs> of a lot of people who do some of the low status, incredibly important things that hold our societies together. And I don't think we've I, I, like I don't think the implications of the way that that has been thrown into relief over the last two years have worked their way out. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you could think about this as the zombies 
you know, these sort of Zoom zombies uh, and the march of the undead towards the ultimate metaverse. Um, I, I was thinking about this in the context of um, the classic Bill Hicks comedy routine where the boss says to him and go, hey, Hicks, why aren't you working? And he goes, well, it's nothing to do. And he goes, well, at least pretend like you're working. And he goes, and he goes, well, why don't you pretend I'm working? You get paid more than me. You fantasize. <laughs> Oh, I tell you what, you mentioned the metaverse, though. I had a bit of a, a spooky thought that someone brought up in a conversation the other day, which is that uh, what if this whole metaverse thing is all part of the preparation for the techno version of degrowth, that there is actually you know, a, a line of thinking amongst some of the, you know, Silicon Valley and Davos folks and so on who are going, well, okay, you know, we do need to radically cut back on the use of resources. Um, here's how we do it. We get everyone sat at their homes, plugged into this virtual world, and we factor out as much as possible of their, you know, we feed them on Soylent Green and so on. And okay, now I'm sounding like I'm going to get taken off YouTube. But <laughs> it's... I, the, there is a certain plausibility to that for me because there is real concern about climate change mm -hmm. amongst those kind of people. There is also a, an inbuilt conviction that they are the brightest, the smartest, the ones who can solve problems. And I don't mean that in some kind of they're part of some grand plot. It's just this kind of meritocratic story mm -hmm. that uh, all of those kind of people like to tell themselves and if you're completely immersed in that logic, then obviously you're the people who need to figure out how we're going to you know, fix climate change and manage the planet and so on. And I, I yeah. can see how that goes wrong. Yeah, well, we so we talked a lot in Series 1 about EM Forced as the machine stops, didn't we? And, like, you know, was the pandemic the machine stopping or us all being drawn more deeply into the machine? I mean, you know, and I know you and I have discussed, um, Paul, Kings North's vaccine moment essays, you know, and his views on this. And um, I think the question he asks, you know, what is the machine for? Is it, yeah, you know, is it for life and beauty? Um, and, and is it actually possible in any, in any sense to wisely manage the current direction of travel? Uh, and I think those are big questions. And I think for those people who have that notion of certainty, and I've been enjoying our mutual friend Sam Conniff's work on un uncertainty experts and our tolerance for uncertainty. Because I, I do think, you know, the the idea, and I touched on this in my recent TEDx, is like the idea of fixing and solving all of these things is around like basically deploying the foot soldiers of, of further control. Um, and I do worry about that mindset as it goes forward, that sense of certainty, that sense of knowing exactly where we are and what we need to do um, is often inherently part of the problem. I tell you one of the moments when I found myself beginning to just unsettle maybe some of the assumptions that had carried me through the first year, year and a bit of the pandemic, it was last September when the 20th anniversary of 9-11 came around and we'd just seen the final kind of humiliating, disastrously organised retreat from Afghanistan by the Americans and everyone else from the international forces that had gone in there. And I just, I found myself remembering the speed of the consensus that seemed to form in the days and weeks after 9-11 and how the consequences of that are still playing out, you know, two decades later and will be for a long time to come. And I just found it unsettling, let's say. And I was, I was reminded of this again, listening back to our voices from those early weeks of the pandemic, unsettling the speed with which the stories of the pandemic seemed to fall into place back then. And I find myself wondering which of those stories that almost anyone who was treated as sane seemed to agree on is which of those are going to let us down as badly as the stories that were how the world made sense of and sort of fell in behind the orthodoxies in that that autumn of of 2001 and i don't know what the answer to that is i just it's one of those things that i find myself chewing on with a certain 
background mm. discomfort. Hindsight is humbling. Was that hindsight? Hindsight is humbling. Yes, an ex-girlfriend of mine used to talk about hindsight. Hindsight, there we go. <laughs> you, you need to... T, hindsight, TM. Yeah, get yours here. Yeah, it was... It, it, she, the things she used to say about it definitely wouldn't have uh, been good marketing slogans for it, let's say that. <laughs> On that note... Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. If you'd like to follow the threads in our conversations further, head over to homewardbound.org. We will also find my substack, Writing Home. You'll find us on Facebook as The Great Humbling, and Ed is at Cool on Twitter. We're always glad to hear from those of you who are listening. And we're deeply grateful for all that our listeners do to spread the word and bring these conversations to new ears by sharing the podcast along your networks and giving it ratings or reviews on the platforms where you listen. These are strange and humbling times. and We need quiet corners, breathing spaces, air pockets and pockets of resistance, places in which to puzzle through how we got here and where we might be going. Thank you for helping us create one of those pockets. <laughs>